Back in 2008, Malcolm Gladwell, a psychologist and business consultant, released a best-selling book called Outliers. In it, he claimed the secret of genius in pretty much any area was not so much innate ability, but more the amount of time dedicated and concerted training a person puts to reaching their goal. And the figure he worked out was 10,000 hours. Here's a quote from him. The amount of time to master a cognitively complex task, whether it's being a brain surgeon or playing chess at an elite level, being a good computer programmer or a classical musical composer, is 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. End of quote. So 10,000 hours, that's three hours a day, seven days a week for 10 years or six hours a day for five years. And this is like concerted focus practice. So for Gladwell, what we call a genius is, is more about the person who had the opportunity to put in those three hours a day, the encouragement to do so, and the motivation to persevere. And so he picks in his book quite a few examples of what you think are like child prodigies. So Mozart, for instance, who was uh, an amazing pianist even when he was a, a boy. Well, he had in fact already racked in 10,000 hours before the age of 10. So it explains something of his greatness there. And then when we think of someone uh, uh, like uh, Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, he actually wasn't the best athlete growing up uh, in his family, nor was he in his school the best uh, basketball player as a teenager. He was pretty good, but he wasn't the best. Um, but it was in the daily grind of training, intense, repetitive training, that made him what he came to be. And he managed to clock in well over 10,000 hours by the time he was 16, and he overtook everyone else around him in doing so. So he wasn't born a genius, but by super hard working, he created his genius. And we find that in like all the great heroes of our secular world, whatever they do, musicians, writers, artists. It involves training, hours of training, and the preparation isn't glamorous, but there's no shortcut to greatness. Greatness only comes on account of it. And with the same, with the great, with the great heroes of our faith, the same truth applies. Here, above all, I'm thinking of like the martyrs, um, those who were able to give up their life for Christ. Their stories are like this also. Because no one passes the ultimate test of holding on to their faith when threatened with death unless they first held on to their faith through many small, seemingly insignificant trials. Unglamorous small acts of self-denial and remaining, remaining committed to a life of prayer and Sunday Mass is what makes the martyr doing these things even when they seemed of such small value. When you look at someone like St. Maximilian Kolbe, you get a really good example of this. You might know about St. Maximilian. He was a martyr in Auschwitz at the concentration camp. Um, you might know that he volunteered to take the place of a married man who had been ma randomly selected to be starved to death. But he was able to step up and take the place of this man to change places with a condemned man not from some amazing burst of uncharacteristic virtue, but rather it was an, oh, an outflowing of the training, of the hours he was clocking in every day from his uh, commitment to Christ. Even when he was a boy, he had committed himself to living the commandments, saying no to sin, preserving his purity, and he took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And we actually see this in, in a famous story about him when he was 12. When he was 12, Our Lady appeared to St. Maximilian and she was holding two crowns, a white one and a red one. And she said to him, Dearest Max, Jesus is very pleased with how you're living and he wants great things from your life. Are you willing to accept either one of these crowns? The white one? the glory of purity, remaining completely dedicated to God, or this red one, the glory of martyrdom, of sacrificing your life in his service. Are you willing to accept either? 
And Maximilian replied back, Blessed Mother, I will accept both. <laughs> so his martyrdom in Auschwitz was not something uncharacteristic that came from nowhere. It was the outflowing of his life, the completion of how he was already living. And in our practice of the faith, when we get moments of big challenge, how we respond to it is going to be as a result of little daily challenges that we face. Of course, if you're still young and haven't found your vocation and entered into it, it's actually a good idea to try and see the small sacrifices that you have to make each day as connected to a bigger picture. You know, if, if like you think you're called by God to one day get married and have a family, you can see all your difficulties at school and stuff as, as preparation for your career. And when you choose to live pure, not to have boyfriends or girlfriends while you're still young and not at a point where you can get married, you do this as a sign of commitment to your future husband or wife. And in fact, you should even pray for that person because God already knows the person he has in mind for you. It's small daily habits here and now that equip you for when the time comes to follow your vocation. I know that's how I made sense of the seven years at seminary, trying to see each of those uh, kind of sometimes ridiculous things that you've got to do at seminary. I had to see them in terms of, of the day of ordination and then of the living out of the priesthood. That's the only way those sacrifices could make any sense. And for those of us who've already passed the point in life where we have looking towards a vocation, maybe if you're retired, still, our lives are still a kind of training or preparation. Like I said, it can be preparation for a challenge that might be waiting for you further down the line, a big test of your faith, or, above all, it's going to be, it's going to be the culmination of our lives, the moment that God will call us to himself when he will judge us. And that is truly the most important moment to prepare for. In the Gospel today, our Lord is talking the to the disciples about martyrdom. They're going to need to be prepared because one day they are going to face the ultimate test. Will they remain true to him and the Catholic faith and as a result have their lives taken from them? Or will they cling to their earthly life for a few more years at the price of disowning our Lord? And unfortunately, that kind of test is still happening today, all around the world. Uh, I read that in Nigeria, even, over the last year, there were 6,700 Catholics martyred just last year in Nigeria. And that's not like an Islamic state or a communist country. Uh, but still, this test of martyrdom is coming to uh, many Catholics. But for us in England, probably, we won't face... Uh, such a direct choice with the sword to our throats. But like I said, our lives are, are a form of preparation for the summons to meet Jesus, which eventually will come to each of us, maybe in an unexpected way. The life of a practicing Catholic, of daily prayer, of the rosary, examination of conscience, regular confession, this is a kind of preparation for the moment when our death will come. And if you have been following the training program, it doesn't come as a fearful enemy about to rob you of what is most valuable to you, but rather as a friend who lets you in through the gate to a new and exciting and glorious existence. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, to have a life that ends well, this doesn't come out of the blue as an anomaly from the earlier part of one's life. Whether we die as God's friends, whether we overcome all the difficulties and temptations which will draw near as our lives uh, come to their close, temptations to despair, temptations to anger or resentment, unforgiveness, how we approach it will be a reflection of the training we put in right now, our serious daily practice of the faith. And probably the best test as to how well you are preparing for that ultimate, you know, that ultimate uh, decisive moment is by considering how well you prepare for Holy Communion at Mass. Because if you think about it, Holy Communion is literally a meeting with Jesus. It's a kind of rehearsal for the moment when he calls you to himself. Have you ever thought about that? 
And so we can ask ourselves these questions. Do I approach Holy Communion as free from sin as I possibly can be by frequent confession and examining my conscience each day? Do I approach Holy Communion with a consciousness that Jesus is there behind the appearances just waiting for me a breath away? Do I approach Holy Communion with a sense that this is the centre and priority of my life? The good news is, if that isn't quite the case yet, we've still got time to improve. And I'm talking to myself here also. Thanks be to God that we still have more time to get serious about real training, to clocking in those daily hours of prayer that seem rather monotonous sometimes. The greatness of being able to conclude your life as an offering to God, it doesn't come from nowhere, it comes from daily preparation. Daily saying no to sin, daily saying yes to God in a thousand little ways. As our Lord said, if anyone, if anyone declares himself for me in the presence of men, I will declare myself for him in the presence of my Father in heaven. But the one who disowns me in the presence of men, I will disown in the presence of my Father in heaven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.